this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. Today, we are getting you set for the NBA restart down in Orlando, breaking down the betting odds for the final seeds in the West and also for the conference championships and the NBA championship with Adam Stanko. He's a co-host of the Rejecting the Screen podcast. We're going to have Adam break down his thoughts on the restart and the impact of the bubble on betting. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, Major League Baseball has been back uh, for about a week now. Already some shakiness there, but hey, the bubble <laughs> seems safe in Orlando, so we're going to get to watch some basketball. How you doing? I'm great. I actually haven't been this excited about the NBA in forever. Uh, it's usually... Well, it's a situation this year where I didn't get March Madness, so yeah. that part of basketball got stripped out of my life. And I'm usually a pretty big fan once the NBA playoffs get rolling, and I've actually kind of really made that my fandom. I don't run as many numbers as I used to on that. But uh, now the NBA is starting again. I think there's a ton of interesting storylines. I'll talk about Milwaukee a little bit at the end. Uh, I'm interested in, in actually watching the Miami Heat. Uh, Duncan Robinson, a uh, former player at Michigan, has become a – standout shooter at Miami and I'm just kind of wondering how his defense is just just kind of because he was never that great a defender so I'm interested in walking watching him I'm interested in watching some Zion Williamson uh so I really enjoy the game of basketball and uh looking forward to the restart well I think the best part about the restart and the bubble in general is that it's going to have an NCAA tournament type feel to it because of like the staggered start time so like you're going to get to watch one game at 2 30 and then other ones will be starting up right when that one gets to the end. So, like, immediately after, like on right. Friday, uh, when the Magic Nets game wraps up, you can jump over to two other games that are starting at 4 p.m. And, like, that staggered start time is, like, it's so – it gets you hooked so easily uh, because you can watch yep. just the end of the game effectively. So, I think that there are a lot of parallels. And I think it's just going to be a really fun scheduling and, like, viewer experience for, you know, even casual basketball fans like myself. Yeah, it'll be good. And once they get into the playoffs and you get some of those games back to back, I think that'll be really nice. Absolutely. So it's going to be pretty fun. We're going to break it all down with Adam Stanko. You can find him on Twitter at Naismith Lives. He is an NBA analyst, uh, does a lot of NBA draft stuff as well. He's a co-host for the Rejecting the Screen podcast. The link for the uh, Apple podcast link for that is in the show notes over at numberfire.com. So if you want a link for that, check it out. Otherwise, you can just search Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever, for Rejecting the Screen. We're talking with Stanko about the NBA, the impact of the bubble, and Ed, uh, hopefully some inside dirt on you because you and Stanko went to high school together. So we, we got to get some embarrassing stories in there too. Yeah, I think I was such a dork that there weren't many uh, embarrassing <laughs> stories. But yes, we did go to high school together. Adam's a great guy. Uh, we kind of reconnected when we both ended up in the sports world. He was uh, working on Sports Center at ESPN. I was uh, trying to claw my way into the world. Um, and um, yeah, it's been really fun just connecting and, and we kind of come at basketball from different perspectives, uh, even though we appreciate the the other's perspective. So I'm, I'm the big numbers guy, but I like to watch games. He wa probably watches more basketball than any human and knows more about the game and, and respects the numbers. So uh, always a great conversation. It's always nice when even if your forte is something else, as long as you understand where the other people are coming from, like a, in a numbers versus film perspective, like as long as you understand where they're coming from, it do, I don't really care if you don't understand numbers. As long as you like get the value of them, I'm never going to get pushed back against you for that. Yeah. Yeah. So and the I, insights, too, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and there is a lot of value in watching games, so I'm glad that we can get that perspective from Adam. So we'll bring Adam in in just one second. If you're looking for some baseball talk, we had Dan Zimborski on last week to preview the 60-game MLB season. He talked about how the Marlins might make the playoffs. <laughs> Poor Dan. <laughs> hey, I mean, they are in first right now, so hey, I guess there's that. Uh, they go how, the are winning percentage. Catch up? How, the, how are they going to catch up in games missing a week? I don't know if they will. Um, yeah. Rob Manfred has said, like, they don't care if everyone gets a 60, in which case they go winning percentage. So if the Marlins just don't play the rest of the year, exactly. they go they by might... winning percentage, they might be in. That would be amazing. I think that they should plan. That would be an amazing way to do like, it. 
pay off the lab. Like, don't actually get your players COVID, but pay off the lab to say they have COVID so that you can just keep, like, their 2-1 and one record or whatever it was against the Phillies and just coast on that. I'm sure there wouldn't be any issues that way. Or maybe, I mean, you know, the Tigers are off to a good start, so maybe they're yeah. at 500 halfway through this. Oh, but wait, they're doing that 16-game playoff, though, right? Yeah, so it's 16 teams in the playoffs. Um, so, like, yeah, you're, you're still – it's still a tough road even if you make the playoffs. But, like, hey, you know, the Tigers can get themselves in, slip slip a lab technician 50 bucks to say you're positive while everyone's <laughs> healthy. You know, what could go wrong? I yeah. see no flaws in this plan personally. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to hear Dan's discussion, check that out by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. You name it, we're probably there. Just search for Covering the Spread. Before we get to Adam, though, I do want to go back to last week. We have one thing to mention with Covering the Past and Pit Road, once again, not being kind to our bets here on Covering the Spread. Covering the Past. All right, so last week here on Covering the Spread and Covering the Future, I mentioned Joey Logano as being my favorite option for NASCAR in Kansas, and he was 16-1 to when we discussed him. He closed at 14-1, to so a little bit of value there, and things started off pretty well for Logano. He actually led the first 27 laps of the race, and then there was a competition caution to allow teams to come in, change their tires, check tire wear, etc. So Logano pitted while leading. And his team got called for a tire violation during the pit stop. So he had to go all the way to the back. Everyone is still in the lead laps. He's restarting like 30 or something like that. And I was like, okay, well, we had a good run for 27 laps. But it was still early. And Logano was working his way back forward. He had gotten back into the top 10 with about 100 laps left. And then he blew a spring or a shock or something like that. Caused a huge wreck. Uh, So... I still like the bet at the number. It didn't work out, obviously. The the pit road violation did not help things, but uh, still okay with the process there. And for those of you who are annoyed with NASCAR bets, just a, a sneak peek, there's no NASCAR in covering the future for today. Ed's talking basketball. I'm talking golf. So your, uh, your paradise has finally arrived. There will be no additional NASCAR discussion on the podcast for today. I'm not saying for the rest of the year it will be back eventually, but at least for this week. You get well, you know Ryan Blaney's reporting. going to win this week. Given oh, that. I know. What? Because, so, I was in Illinois for the past two races, which meant that I was, like, able to mobile sports bet uh, because they actually have it there because New York is stupid. And I was actually able to bet on Ryan Blaney. And so now this will be the first race since I left Illinois, which means, like, it's a guarantee <laughs> he wins. There, There is no other way around this. Like, he's been good on the short flat tracks, so it's just... You might as well go ahead to just sprint to the betting window and bet Ryan Blaney right now. Yeah, exactly. It always happens that way, Ed. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the NBA in just one second. But first, for years, Numberfire's premium subscription service has provided our users with expert analysis, survivor pool tools, and most importantly, the fantasy football draft kit all for just or for up to forty nine ninety nine a month. Now, as a way of saying thank you to our community for years of support, Numberfire is rolling out a new premium package for just $9.99 a month that will provide you with all the sports betting and daily fantasy tools you need year-round. The best part is that expert analysis, those survivor tools, and yes, even the draft kit are totally free. The rankings that I do with JJ Zacharyson and Brandon Gadula, those are free. So head to numberfire.com, check out the new and improved site, and take advantage of the new premium package. Numberfire.com. $9.99 $9.99 a month for the new premium. Let's bring in Adam Stanko now. Follow him on Twitter at Naismith Lives. He is an NBA analyst and a big NBA draft guru, but today we're talking about the resumption of play for the NBA. Check out Adam's podcast. It's called Rejecting the Screen. Wherever you get your podcasts, let's bring him in now to chat about what we can expect in this bubble environment for the NBA. Covering the present. Let's bring Adam Stanko into covering the spread to get set for the restart in the NBA. Adam, I appreciate the time. NBA launching back up this week. How you doing today? I'm excited. I mean, you have to be pumped up. It's It's been so long, a weird time, but uh, excited to get actual games that matter again on the court. Absolutely. Now, Ed made the major mistake before we started recording of letting slip that you two went to high school together. So we got to drill you. Yes. What was Ed Fang like in high school? Well, he's he's a brilliant guy, and you, you picked up on that back then. Uh, a nice guy. We served uh, in student council together, okay. actually, Ed and I, as, as we go back. But, yeah, just a really nice guy that we all knew had a really bright future, and um, obviously he's on this show. 
so everything uh, turned out as planned, right? That's it's just as you planned it, Ed. I'm sure. Exactly. Thanks for not uh, revealing my true nature as a dork back in uh, <laughs> Westchester. <laughs> Absolutely appreciate that. No, proud alum, proud alum. I'm, I'm <laughs> excited that we are proud alums together. Yeah. That, so we did serve on the student council, and I've actually been back to East a couple times in the last couple years because my folks still live there. And there's a picture of the two of us and whoever else was on student council <laughs> that you can see from the outside. You don't even need to get into the building. Um, oh, that's funny. Well, it's, okay. it's even better that like a few years after we we were there, maybe it was, I don't know, my brother was there 10 years after I was. Like I used to get calls from him and his friends in high school. He's 10 years younger than me. And he's like, what did you guys wear? And this was only like 10 years prior. I'm like, how bad could it have been in 10 years? But it's probably so, pretty bad. Yes, yes, there's no question. We we looked a lot different and acted differently too, Ed, I'm sure. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, sure. I'm sad there is no dirt on Ed Fang, but I appreciate the loyalty, Adam, regardless. Sure. Uh, sure. Well, what have things been like for you for the past couple of months? I know you said you've got uh, a new child, so congratulations on that, but I feel like that would just lead to kind of a hectic household when there there are no sports on and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's been kind of crazy. I mean, four kids, Avery 16, Bella 14, Hudson's three, and then Skylar, our newborn, is, is just three months old. So going through a, a birth during quarantine was crazy. Uh, the hospital situation was really weird. Um, and just trying to manage day to day has been kind of crazy, trying to figure out the schedules. My wife's trying to work out and I'm like, no, I got a podcast to do or, yep. you know, I have a call that I have to make. And so, you know, just like the rest of us, we're all just trying to manage and balance it. But uh, like I said, I definitely didn't finish Netflix like the rest of us. I saw <laughs> Tiger King, of course, and I've seen some <laughs> other shows, but 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 the free time is, is few and far between. I'm definitely not bored. I can say that much. Absolutely. So you're podcasting from your garage today. Is that your like default mm. area for doing podcasts this time <laughs> yes. uh, during quarantine? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I've, it's like my hidden spot. The three-year-old doesn't typically come out and bother me if I'm, if I'm in the garage. So uh, it's the one spot I can kind of get away my sanctuary and uh, yeah, talk some hoops. So I'm excited to do it today. It's, it's nice to actually get to talk NBA and not the idea of NBA actually happening. Right. It'll be nice to actually get games on the court. Absolutely. And we'll be doing exactly that uh, this week, starting with Thursday nights. So let's talk about uh, those games, because we've seen sports come back with no fans. And that's one thing. But the NBA is a bit different because not only are there no fans, but it's not a true home court because they're playing in this bubble. We don't really have a sample necessarily on that yet. So are you expecting any major changes in gameplay, like individual games when they're playing in the bubble versus what we were seeing before the COVID-19 layoff? Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, you touch on it. The, the, the idea that there's no home court advantage changes everything. I mean, we'll, we'll see that obviously in the playoffs during the quote unquote regular season with these eight games as, as, as they're going to be played. But I think that the big thing for me is that when you don't have home court advantage, what that means is Sports Illustrated did a study years ago and found that the biggest change in, in home court advantage is, of course, the officiating. So I expect we're going to see more neutral officiating, so there won't be a swing one way or the other, obviously. And then the other thing for me is role players. I think anytime, especially when you go on the road, it's really difficult for role, role players to take on an expanded role and really outperform what our expectations are. And when you see guys working out, and I spend every summer, I go down. Don McLean's a good friend of mine, who's former NBA Most Improved Player, Pac-12's all-time leading scorer. Don does workouts with some of the best guys in the draft every year. When I go down and watch those guys, what would blow you away when you see NBA guys working out, especially as they're working out very hard for the draft, is that like, there isn't much that separates the great, great players from the guys that are good. Like it's, it's tough to really tell. Sometimes you get a guy that just blows you away. But for the most part, there's, the difference is, is very marginal. And so because of that, Really what you see is what kind of guys can replicate what they do in practice or in a workout actually when they're in front of 20,000 fans. So what I'm expecting is actually that we're going to see some just outlier performances from the role guys. And especially when, you, again, you talk no home away advantage. And we've already sort of seen that somewhat. Matt Thomas of the Raptors hit four threes the other night. Um, we saw um, 
Well, Duncan Robinson, uh, you know, he had a great night uh, also for, for the Miami Heat, although he's one of the best shooters in the league, a Michigan guy, of course, said. But yeah. but I, I just call it like the, the Marco Bellinelli effect, like a, a guy that can explode in summer league. We, we always see these crazy summer league performances, and then guys are never able to replicate that at the NBA level. I think we're going to see that. I think guys just are going to feel so comfortable and just feel so loose and relaxed. I think role playing is the role players are the biggest factor that will come into play. That's fascinating. I mean, Jim, have, have some of you DFS guys done the study on like role players home and away and, and what to do in those cases? It's probably out there somewhere. I've never seen it, uh, but I bet that someone's probably done it. Uh, but it's something that I would love to read. And I think like it kind of makes sense what you're saying, Adam, too. Like some guys, maybe they're a role player for a reason versus being a full fledged star. Maybe it is something along that nature that keeps them from getting to that level. So I can see why you'd be looking at that as being a potential impact in the situation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, I mean, look, there's, there's, Usually there's two types of guys in the NBA. You have your superstars, and then ultimately now you have specialists. And that's really what the leagues come down to. They, they refer to it as you're heading into the draft is plus one skill. What's your plus one? Are you a great rebounder? Are you a really good defender? Are you a great shooter? And so guys are able to do those things, but as specialists. But again, if you see those same guys in a practice setting, you see them in a workout, the average fan would be blown away at just – like how loose they are, how good their ball handling ability is, how the, the range on their shot. But but again, everything tightens up when all of a sudden you get to an NBA arena and you're playing in front of 15, 20,000 fans. Now, all of a sudden, when you're playing in front of friends and family and it's a loose setting, you're going to see guys get more creative with the ball. You're going to see them play loose. You're not going to feel this intense pressure. And I think that's that's going to change things. So even the specialists, you're going to start to see, I, I'm telling you, you're going to start to see different ball handling moves come out uh, and just a, a different level of play. And that's, again, where the big difference is, especially when you get to the playoffs where the home team has such an advantage and, and the role players play well at home. Think about the momentum. You hit a shot and all the crowd gets behind you. We all know what that feels, that adrenaline rush, maybe not in that same situation, but we know what it's like when people are rooting for us and the, you know, the, the influence that has over us. But then you go on the road and now – you know, people are booing you and they, they don't want to see you touch the ball. Nerves set in. We get tight. Shots come up shorter. You're not getting as deep, um, you know, in terms of bending your knees. And so all those things come into play that I don't think will impact these games at all. So, Adam, uh, I love having you on whatever podcast I'm on uh, because you watch <laughs> many games. And uh, I know it's probably not politically correct, but I call you my hoops junkie because you really get in there. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, exhibition games in Orlando uh, anything that you're noticing from that that can give us an edge heading forward as we as the game start to count again? I mean, really, it's just been about health and seeing which teams get guys back that are that are healthy and stuff. We see Nurkic return for uh, for Portland. Uh, I think that's been huge. Just seeing these rosters sort of come together and gel again, and it, it's weird because it's a lot of feeling out of the process. We haven't seen teams actually as much as I thought, like play guys extended minutes. Uh, there was a big worry and a big concern coming in about, you know, how are guys going to be in terms of their physical fitness and, and that basketball shape is different than than just being in shape, period, because we know guys are running. But a lot of guys didn't get access to a five. Well, nobody really had access to five on five games. They had a chance maybe to do some workouts and they certainly were in touch with their teams on a daily, if not you know, every other day basis. I mean, a lot of meetings were set up. There's a lot of film study that was going on. People were using Zoom just like the rest of us. That that was happening in the league. But the thing was, in terms of the actual, you know, shape that guys are in. So there hasn't really been, though, that concern. I think more now is how, if you're looking at, at games, and I think the biggest thing that stood out to me is just minutes. So teams are sort of holding back their stars minutes, their starters, you know, their, their rotation guys and playing a lot of guys that are deeper on the bench, because I think more than anything, I think guys are worried about injuries. And especially as they come down the home stretch, if you have a playoff spot secure, these eight games mean nothing because again, you've taken away home court advantage. So maybe you're a little bit concerned about your matchup that, that sometimes comes into play. Teams will lose games or try to win games based upon the better matchup. But you know, in terms of really trying to get home court advantage, which, again, was so critical in years past, just just won't play a factor this year. So are you expecting those minute limits to be in place for the regular season or I guess, quote unquote, the, the seeding games uh, once we get there for the teams that are pretty locked in? Are you expecting the minutes on the superstars to be capped there? I, I think it goes team by team. And, yeah. and I, th I look at the Bucs as, as a great example. They're a team that 
obviously haven't been to the NBA finals with this, with this current group. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on Giannis. Uh, he, he's likely the MVP and the defensive player of the year. So you're talking about, and then they have a whole bunch of shooters. I mean, there's so many shooters on, on that roster, so many guys capable of hitting threes, but they depend upon their depth. I think that in this case, like I think the Bucks are going to just try to see what they can do to get themselves in the best position going forward. So I think I look at the Bucks and I think actually they'll tune it up. Like I think Bucks are going to look like a, a minute situation like they would have been during the regular season. But you compare that to what maybe the Lakers and Clippers, who feel a little more confidently, guys have been there before, and I think they know what they have. They feel like, unless it's one of the other L.A. teams, no one's going to touch them. So I think those teams are going to handle a little bit, a little bit, little bit differently. We won't see the guys play as much as we typically would, especially you figure with Kawhi's injury history, Paul George coming off his injury. So I think those situations are different. LeBron's age obviously playing a factor. So it's it's team by team, but I think you you have to look at it to try to figure that out. And that's really difficult for the, you know, over under win totals for these these final eight. Sure, absolutely. So you mentioned uh, Yusuf Nurkic for Portland, and we've had a lot of time between the end of the, the beginning of the layoff and now. So teams' rosters have changed. Players have come back from health. Some players have opted out and decided not to play here. Are there any rosters you're expecting to major, uh, to deviate majorly from where they were back in March? I mean, I, the Blazers, to me, are, are the one that really stand out. I mean, now you're talking about a team that, uh, you know, relied so heavily on the backcourt and what they were able to do uh, with Dame and C.J. McCollum. And now you add Nurkic, a healthy Nurkic, and uh, there was no way he would have obviously played given the circumstances. Now, obviously, they have a push, push to make in order to even get in the playoffs. So... And you look, it's going to be so strange because you see a team so desperate and then you take that situation for that eighth spot there in the West. And, you know, you factor in the idea that the Grizzlies are so young and that's going to be interesting to see because one of the things that I kept hearing from NBA people is that the vets know how, <clears throat> not necessarily how to turn it back on, but they know what was required to get themselves in game shape. They know what was required mentally and to keep up a certain amount of focus uh, and the younger guys, that, that's who the execs are worried about. That's who the coaches are worried about. What was their their regimen like in this quote unquote offseason? What were they doing during their downtime during the quarantine? And are they able to get themselves mentally focused? I keep kept hearing that, that this mental focus. You're going to be in this bubble. It's such a unique situation. The Blazers, though, have something to play for. They already were heavy in the backcourt. And now all of a sudden you had Nurkic, who looked great, uh, you know, and, and, and so far in this preseason or this uh, these scrimmages like we're seeing uh, a team that now can get you they can play any style they sort of want they have different weapons they they have now an alternate score that doesn't just come from the backcourt so that's huge posting up if their floor spacing is going to be terrific so I just think that the Blazers to me are the one team that I, that I look at also there were questions about the Sixers health and I think Sixers are another team that you really have to take a look at as anytime you can make sure that Joel Embiid is rested and ready to go. Sixers are going to be in great shape. And I think Ben Simmons should be in discussion for defense player of the year. I mean, he's a guy lead league in, uh, in steals uh, and causes so many issues for opposing guards, although we know that he's going to be playing power for now. That's been the talk for from the Sixers camp. So the question is, I'm curious, is, to, is he still going to guard point guards? Because I think it's been a huge advantage defensively for the Sixers. So I look at those two teams as the one that benefited the most from what's happened now with this crazy layoff. Awesome. I can't wait to get to get to the knucklehead 76ers in a little bit but uh, <laughs> let's, let's stick to the western conference uh mm -hmm. you mentioned a lot about portland and and memphis uh they're battling for that for that last spot uh where do you think that finally goes and do you see any value in some of the odds well i i think it's gonna be tough to overcome in just such a short amount of time if we were talking about you know 15 games left then i would think that i would look at especially if you return to healthy nurkic i would look at the blazers of potential obviously a lot of talk about the Pelicans and what Zion Williamson's going to be able to do. We've seen some video already of him shooting threes, and he looks comfortable, uh, slimmed down like you know this this hulking figure. But I, but I, I, I don't know. I just think it's almost too much to overcome. I mean, there really isn't that much that we know that the Grizzlies have to do. And plus, we talked about the the mental focus, but there's also this idea of youth and and the fact that these guys are still playing. We know John Morant was is still in tremendous shape. Uh, Jaron Jackson. I, I'm excited to see what, what the Grizzlies can do down the stretch. They don't have to do much in order to earn that spot. So while 
yes, if I was going to go with anyone, it would be the Blazers. But I just think in such a short amount of time, it's going to be really difficult to make up that ground. Yeah, definitely. Uh, not a lot of time to do that. Uh, the Grizzlies right now, minus 140 to make the playoffs. Over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the Trailblazers plus 420. So maybe if you you think they can make up that ground, could go there. But uh, like like Adam said, not a lot of time to do so. So let's focus on some conference odds here. Try to pin down who's going to go to the championship in the West. The Lakers are plus 160. The Clippers plus 170. The heavy favorites to win the conference. Would you ride with either of those two teams at their current odds? Or is there a long shot who you think could dethrone one of those L.A. teams? Well, here's the deal. I, I think the Clippers are going to go. I, I just love that that roster makeup. I love their depth. Uh, they can play different styles. Uh, Lou Williams is such an X factor for me. I mean, it, it's impossible to call him underrated because of the the career that he that he's had. But Lou Williams is going to be just deadly in these situations. He can heat up in a hurry. Uh, we know what Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, especially healthy, are going to be able to do. So if I were if I were to, if you were to ask me right now who's going from the West, I would say the Clippers, and and I'm not alone in that thinking, obviously. But to me, the the other two teams to look at are, um, and are the Nuggets, and um, just lost, lost my train of thought. So, well, tell us about the Nuggets. Well, well, yeah, let's start with the Nuggets. So, so, so the Nuggets. Um, it obviously starts with the Joker. I mean, he's he's coming in tremendously healthy. What him and Jamal Murray are able to do with a two-man game, they just create a lot of matchup problems for you. There just aren't other bigs that can that can face up with with the Nuggets in in the West, um, and so that's an issue. But then the Rockets are the other one, and it's because they play so loose. And we know, and I know what we're dealing right now with just the superstars, but. The thing is, as I talked about, role players are going to play loose. The Rockets already play loose. They already play this style. And you know what kind of effort you're going to get from Russell Westbrook. You know what James Harden is going to do over the course of these games. It's almost like what I said about role players and having these outlier experiences. I think from for the Rockets' perspective, their superstars are going to take it up a notch. Plus, they've already committed themselves to playing small ball. That's that's what they've decided to do. Robert Covington now using him at the five. This team is just so unique in terms of their their build and their and their setup and the fact that they're going to be able to play fast, the fact that they can score at a crazy rate. I just really like what what it is that uh, that the Rockets are going to be able to bring to the table. And so the way I'm sort of looking at this is like I almost think we have to start from square one and say Forget everything we just learned. If you were to take all these rosters right now, especially because we've had an offseason, we don't know how that's going to impact teams. But it's almost like the you know, game at the back of the bus that you'd play, like whether we were in East High School or what have you, where you sit there and go, hey, if everybody was together in a neutral tournament, how would this thing shake out? And if you look at it that way and you start to take away home court advantage, you start to take away who's the favorite, who's the pressure on, and all of a sudden you lose all that, just say, hey, empty gym. It's almost like pickup. Like all these teams are going at it. Who would you favor? And I and I look at right now the Rockets and Nuggets as two teams that could certainly threaten. So if I were to go more of a long shot pick, I'd go there. But my my first choice is is the Clippers. Excellent stuff. Let's go over to the East. Uh, the Bucks are uh, minus one sixty five to win the East. Um, I believe that they've been the best team in the NBA for the last two seasons. Uh, really could have done better last year. Um, is anyone going to challenge them in the East? I mean, look, there's so many variables right now that, of course, that, that a team could potentially challenge them. We know, like I said, what the Sixers all of a sudden who, look, the Sixers' biggest weakness is they couldn't win on the road. They had a terrible road record uh, the first half of the year. They were, they were just not very good on the road and did well at home. Well, now all of a sudden that's a non-factor. It's a non-starter for them. You know defensively they're going to be great. Ben Simmons adds a lot defensively. Plus, you've got Joel Embiid, who's now healthy. You've got Matisse Thibel, who I think, is one of the most underrated defensive players in the NBA. Thought he'd be a game changer coming in, the kid from Washington. And, we, and we've seen that. So defensively, they can certainly get after you. And if Ben Simmons is playing power forward, they are committed to actually doing that. And it's not just lip service. Then it's also going to give a look that's sort of unique. And I don't know that any teams can sort of say, hey, the look we're providing with our superstar is different than what you've seen in the past. And so that becomes an X factor. Celtics, of course, are, are going to be a difficult matchup. But when I look at the Bucks, I'm with you, Ed. I mean, you're talking about a team that best defensive rating in the NBA, best pace. They scored a really high clip. And like I said, Giannis is such a game changer offensively and defensively. He can basically get wherever he wants on the floor, do whatever he wants on the floor. And then 
they have contributions from just so many people. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Pat Connaughton, uh, you, you know, Lopez, uh, Eric Bledsoe. They, the fact of the matter is that never mind Chris Middleton. They could just throw so many weapons at you. They're so deep. And so it doesn't matter if they have guys that are having off shooting nights. They'll just replace them. And it, it doesn't really matter. Now, typically in the playoffs, your bench shortens up. That We know that the rotation shortened. But here's, again, the difference. I don't know that you have to do that anymore. The reason you typically would shorten your rotation is you get the most out of the guys that, that you know you can count on. Well, again, if you're not worried about performance on the road or travel or, you know, fatigue and those kinds of things, then, like, all these guys can play. So they're all going to play, and that's still going to be an advantage for the Bucks come playoff time. So let's yeah. stick with those Bucks and talk about uh, the NBA championship because they are obviously the favorites right now. We got the Lakers and the Clippers, all three teams plus 320 or shorter. So, Adam, just who you got win it all when all is said and done uh, over in October? I like the Clippers. I, I love what – I mean, Paul George and, and Kawhi Leonard, we could talk about what they do offensively and Kawhi Leonard shot against the Sixers last year. Sorry, Ed, I know as a <laughs> Sixers fan how that how that felt. But, but I – but. I look at those guys, though, and the big difference to me is what they're what they're able to do defensively. And there's really nobody else in the league that can trot out two guys that are just shut down, shut down players. And those guys just don't exist in the NBA. There's you can you can count on both hands how many guys that you can put on a superstar one on one. And if they're really committed to locking them down over the course of the game, that they can really impact them defensively. It's usually about team defense and it's usually the role you play in that in that regard. But Paul George and Kawhi Leonard went healthy. Both of them have the ability really to just guard basically anyone on the floor and and cause just crazy matchup problems defensively. And when you have two of them, uh, look, we just watched with the last dance what, what the Bulls were able to do with Michael Jordan and, and Scottie Pippen and, and obviously Dennis Rodman. You know, you start throwing those guys in. It's the same. It's sort of the same concept because it helps in, in today's NBA with all the switching that takes place and all those guys are just locked down defenders. They're going to lock down their man. And so whether it's LeBron, they pose a problem for, or whether it's um, going to be Giannis. Like the fact of the matter is they can, you're never going to stop them, but they can neutralize your superstar. And then they have another elite defender that can also do the same for, for someone else who you're hoping for as a second, a second tier guy that can also be a secondary scorer for you. So I think that that's a huge advantage for the Clippers. And like I said, then you throw Lou Williams in, which we know he's going to have some monster games come playoff time. And um, I just, I I really like their depth. I I like the Clippers a lot. So Adam's been talking about the Clippers since last off season when, when all these signings happen. So definitely very consistent there. Uh, Before we let you go, Adam, um, Mm -hmm. the Clippers are a four point dog against the Lakers tomorrow night. Uh, based on what you said, or maybe there's some, you know, some situations with a player not playing, do you find some value in Clippers plus four against the Lakers? You know, I typically would, but it'd be really hard to bet against LeBron James when all of a sudden the lights are brightest against the (laughs) fellow LA team. I like the Clippers over the course of a series against the Lakers, but I just think in a one game setup, there's so much riding. There wasn't a person in the NBA who wanted the NBA, (coughs) excuse me, to return more than LeBron did. When you think about (laughs) it, his legacy is on the line here. And I don't know that you could say that. And I I say on the line, I mean, we know where his legacy stands, but I'm saying for him personally, Mm -hmm. because I think he always looks at these challenges. How does he match up as people are going to rate him against Michael Jordan? And if you really think about it, now LeBron has won with two different teams. This would be the third team that he's won with. It'd be his fourth NBA title. And, And in addition to those things, he could do the one thing that Jordan can say that he never did, and that is, you know, win one in the bubble when when everything was <laughs> at its craziest. And and the same thing doesn't really apply when you look around to the other superstars, Kawhi Leonard, to Giannis, to James Harden. Those those same things though don't apply. And and I think we may look at this year, we will look at this year as having an asterisk on it. But if LeBron wins it, it's only going to enhance his legacy. Whereas if it's only Giannis's only title, let's say, we might look back and say, yeah, but it was it was in the bubble. A, an extra motivated LeBron James is a terrifying, terrifying thought for a <laughs> exactly. lot of people. That is Adam Stanko. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Naismith Lives, or is it Lives? Lives? Lives. Naismith okay. Lives. Yep. Naismith yep. Lives. There we go. All right. That is Adam Stanko. Follow him there, Adam. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time today, and enjoy the NBA again tomorrow. This was awesome. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Covering the future. 
Big thank you once again to Adam Stanko for coming on and previewing the NBA bubble down in Orlando. Check out his podcast called Rejecting the Screen, wherever you get your podcast. Ned, I was refreshed to hear that there's another student council nerd on the podcast because I... I was that as well. It was a very small high school, so I don't know if it actually counts that it was on student council. Uh, but we're just we're we're locked and loaded with student government here. Yeah, absolutely. And that's probably the last time I was involved in student government too. So, but uh, yeah, as a senior in high school, I was student council president at Westchester East High School. Yep. And if you don't believe me, there's still a picture that you don't even <laughs> need to get into the building to see. Yeah, when I when I uh, I ran for class president, which is separate uh, separate from student council, didn't realize I had to plan the reunions um, after that. So yeah. mistakes were made. If you are a high school listener to this podcast, a you probably shouldn't because I'm not sure if it's like legal for you to bet. Anyway, independent of that, consider planning reunions when you run for those things because five years down the line you might be a little annoyed about that. I'll just put it that way. Uh, but big thank you once again to Adam for swinging by and breaking down the NBA. And Ed, today for covering the future, more NBA talk because you want to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. And it sounds like you may be into them despite the short odds. So what draws you towards Milwaukee with where they currently sit? Well, Milwaukee's been the best team in the NBA over the past two seasons. Uh, it, it's verified by the numbers. We talk about that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, they lost in the playoffs to Toronto last year. Toronto came out with a great plan. It was um, the one series where Giannis really couldn't get where he wanted. Toronto just had a defensive plan uh, ready for him. I still think it was a little bit flukish. Uh, I think Milwaukee was definitely the better team. But everything just kind of fell. Uh, everything worked out for Toronto last year. If you think about the last second shot they hit against Philly um, at the uh, Game 7, I had a great, great series against Milwaukee. And then, um, you know, the luck of having a bunch of the stars of the Warriors not playing last year. Still, Milwaukee's the best team in the NBA. Uh, when you look at margin of victory, adjusted for strength of schedule, these are the team rankings that I publish over at my site, the Power Rank. Milwaukee is about 1.7 points better than the Lakers. And we can just look at, you know, the difference in ratings because everything is, is a neutral site in this bowl. But, Ed, you might be saying, well, you know, LeBron hasn't played every game. There's load management. And I would say, yes, that's true. But I've actually been messing around with uh, some calculations where I look at market and the closing point spreads. And then I actually account for only games in which your star players have played. So for the Lakers, that's going to be LeBron and, and Anthony Davis. For the Bucs, that's going to be Giannis and, and Chris Middleton. And when they have those both their key players, I can take the closing point spreads um, adjust for who they played, same strength of schedule adjustments that, that I always do, and and then rank those teams. And the Bucs are still a point and a half better. So the markets think that the Bucs are a point and a half better, unless you think LeBron is all of a sudden going to become Superman in the playoffs. I mean, he already is Superman. Great player. But the other thing that you should think about, I, I think to, to, to make the Lakers the favorite, you really have to think that LeBron's going to take it up a significant notch in the playoffs. Not out of the question, but um, I, I still like Milwaukee. Also, Milwaukee has a much clearer road in the East. You can kind of just see that in the FanDuel odds, just the likelihood they are to, to make the finals and win the Eastern Conference. The West uh, has all the other good teams in the NBA. Adam talked a lot about the Clippers. He thinks they're a great team. The Rockets, the Nuggets, all these teams could uh, make the path really difficult for the Lakers. Um, now, normally, I would take these numbers. I would crank out you know, some win probability based on the playoffs. I've done that in the past. I'm not going to this year because I think the case is clear. Like This is the best team in the weaker conference. Um, I think there's value at Milwaukee. Uh, definitely shop around a little bit. Um, I think there are some probably some of the best odds I saw over at Bet Online. So, but I definitely like Milwaukee to win the NBA championship this year. They're plus 240 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Is that an appropriate number based on the numbers you've run yourself? Well, I mean, I think that's a pretty sharp number. So yeah. I'm just saying shop around. because Right. <laughs> you have you options. Have you have options. Exploit have said options. I think the other thing that is a positive for Milwaukee is kind of something that Adam was talking about, where the depth is so good that they don't have to burn their guys out. Whereas LeBron in that, that series, inevitable series against the Clippers – like, is a LeBron going to be playing, like, 43 minutes a game at that point? Right. Um, can you do that for two straight series? 
that's hard. Um, so I think that the logic of taking the team with the path of least resistance, especially here when there are two really, really good teams in the Western Conference, I think it makes sense to kind of play that narrative and go with the Bucks based on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, a lot of my numbers think that Houston's probably a better team with their two superstars than anyone else in the East, except for Milwaukee. Right. So that that certainly, if that, you know, that ends up being... I guess the second round matchup, that's going to be hard as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Ed likes the Bucks. Make sure you uh, shop around, try to find the best number on that. But again, they are plus 240 at FanDuel Sportsbook. My covering the future for this week is talking some golf. We got the WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational. The mouthful is coming up this week. And it's a really good feel because it is a WGC event. So bigger names have some longer numbers tied to them. But even considering that, I think I want to dive in on Brooks Kepka at 31 to 1. And Kepka is that long for a reason. And that reason is he has said flat out, doesn't always try in non major events. He's not always, you know, going 100%, doesn't practice before them. And this is not a major. So hard to expect Kepka to give his all. But he won this event last year. But again, it wasn't because he had his best showing. He just happened to get super hot with the putter, gained more than nine strokes putting. You cannot project that to continue. So if you're going to bet Kepka this weekend, do not bet him based on his win last year. Instead, I want to focus on what he did last week, specifically what he did with his tee to green play. And that may sound kind of weird because he missed the cut last week. So using that as a justification for betting Brooks Kepka this week may seem kind of weird. But in the two rounds that he played, Kepka gained 5.3 strokes tee to green, gained 3.3 off the tee, and 1.8 on the approach. The ball striking was really, really good for Kepka, and that's the more stable number, but he lost 5.1 strokes putting. The week before that, he lost 5.1 strokes around the green, and so we've seen Kepka struggle with his short game. But that's not as sticky week to week as the ball striking numbers are. And the ball striking numbers, as mentioned, have been pretty good. He also gained 6.9 strokes off the tee in the RBC Heritage just about a month ago, finished seventh there. So we know the upside is very much there for Kepka. This kind of has to actually try a little bit when it comes to the short game. I also wouldn't expect the putting to be as bad this week as it was last week because they're back on Bermuda Greens this week, which is the best putting surface for Brooks Kepka. He ranks 14th in the field in Bermuda putting over the past 100 rounds. That's according to Fantasy National. So if Kepka can bring the ball striking he had last week and pair it with his general putting on Bermuda, we could see another really big week here. And it's just kind of, I think when you look at the odds and compare people around Kepka. It's hard not to be intrigued, even knowing that he may not try this weekend. He is in the same range as Daniel Berger. He is in the same range as Colin Morikawa, Hideki Matsuyama, Tyrrell Hatton. Those are all really good golfers. Berger, Morikawa, recent winners, but they don't have the same upside, the same ceiling as Kepka does when he's on. So if Kepka were among the favorites, I wouldn't touch him because I know he could just totally degaff it this entire weekend and not try. But he's 31 to 1. I think that's long enough for me to take that risk for this weekend. So I think Brooks Kepka makes a lot of sense to bet uh, for the WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational. And I know, Ed, it's probably weird for me to be talking golf when we have NBA, baseball, hockey, all these things that's going great. on. But um, I don't know as much about NBA as you and Adam. So I figured I'd stick to, to what I know better for this week. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. I, Things are still going on with NASCAR, too. You can still bet Ryan Blaney if we're not talking about him here on this I mean, podcast. It's, the, it's an What's auto that? bet based on your model, right? So. Absolutely. Oh, well, not this week. Uh, this week, it's more of a Kyle Busch week. If you want one, it's a Kyle Busch week uh, for the first time this year. But uh, I think that I'll also talk myself into Blaney because I am me and I know me. Uh, but, Ed, we've got NBA, MLB, NHL just around the corner. We've finally got... Yeah. Sports back. I know, I know, obviously, the virus is still terrorizing this entire country, but it's nice to have that release just kind of to think about something else for a couple minutes uh, each day. Yeah, absolutely. And here in, uh, in southeastern Michigan, uh, the Tr Detroit Tigers are off to a pretty good start. <laughs> been defying yeah. all the odds so far. Um, so that's been that's been nice. And I'm looking forward to, to watching some NBA. 
Absolutely. So the next couple of weeks, as long as uh, things stay on track, should be a whole lot of fun. That is all that we have for this week here on Covering the Spread. Back again next week, though, recording that one on Wednesday. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, we are there. And if you like what you hear, please leave a rating and review as well. Big thank you once again to Adam Stanko. Follow him on Twitter at NaismithLives. Check out his podcast, Rejecting the Screen, as well, wherever you get your podcasts. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? I saw you had a new article up, I think, uh, about three-point yeah. shooting. Yeah, so I talk about predictability versus skill. So normally when we think about predictability, we take a statistic and we look at whether it correlates from season to season when we're trying to make preseason predictions. Um, and usually that's related to some underlying skill. And But we get into problems with this, especially with three-point shooting. So three-point shooting for players in the NBA is very unpredictable from season to season. But that's kind of mind-boggling because we, we know that it's a skill, right? We know that we will always take Steph Curry in a three-point shooting contest over Russell Westbrook. So what I did in the article was say, okay, well, we have some notion of predictability, even though you know, the year-to-year -year correlation isn't exactly the best, and I get into that. But we have a different notion for skill. And the, the, the notion is that we should look at the distribution of players and their three-point shooting percentages. And the more that we see extremes in that, the more that we know it's skill. And uh, I lay it out uh, a little, you know, because if, if you have, you know, people that are, uh, you know, nine standard deviations better than the NBA average, it, it's probably more skill in that. It's not just randomness that's, right. that's causing that. So um, I get into it. Um, you can check that out over at the Football Analytics Show. That's my podcast. There's an audio version over at thepowerrank.com slash blog. There's a, there's a written version. Um, I think if you're ever going to check out one thing that I do, uh, I think you should check this out um, because I think it it's a different way of looking at this notion of skill. And I, oh, and um, it, it's kind of weird that I spent like almost 1,800 words teasing something in, in basketball, which I normally don't do, to get at some stuff with football. But this this all matters for football. This is, this is why I did it. Um, and uh, I'll be revealing those things in the next month. And that's what I was thinking, too, is that's a concept that applies to more than just three-point shooting, too. So you can kind exactly. of double dip, which is nice. All right, so right. Uh, check that out in the Football Analytics Show for the audio version and the PowerRank.com slash blog for the written version. And make sure you follow Ed on Twitter as well, at the Power Rank there. I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer for the video side of things here today. Thank Thank you, Cal, as always, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. You have made it to the NBA restart. That is back again tomorrow night. Enjoy the basketball. Good luck with your bets. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>